Hello, everybody. This is the second tutorial on analyzing data on syntactic changes using the technique of logistic regression. And today is the day that we finally reap the fruit of our hard labor because for the last few weeks, we have been collecting data on the loss of dative experiences in the history of English from about 1370 to 1600 in a corpus of about 4.5 million words. So thanks to everybody uh, for collecting this data uh, and for taking this task so seriously. The final data is very, very good. I would even say it is probably the best data set that has ever been collected on this change. Uh, unfortunately, I've only had time to correct and go through the data set for the verb like. So today we are exclusively going to deal with this uh, verb and then next week, hopefully data for the other verbs need, rule, fear and so on as well. Uh, the conservative form shows state of experiences in particular with pronouns as it one your company liketh me full well that's from 1409 or in two to feel it and to see it as often as him like it that's from 1390 so here we have me and him those are unambiguously dative the innovative form is nominative as in three in faith i like well this question from 1571 or in four, he liketh not to be tempted from 1600. Where there are two noun phrases, the um, forms will be ambiguous, as in five, uh, six. The words, his mother spake, Leander liked very well. This could either mean uh, Leander nominative liked the words um, accusative, or it could be the other way around, the words subject pleased Leander object. We don't know which interpretation the author had in mind. Or in six, how doth Christ like his righteousness? Either Christ subject likes this righteousness is the interpretation, or this righteousness subject pleased Christ is the object is the interpretation. The final data set has 486 examples. That might not sound like very much, and yes, it is a relatively small data set, but I'm quite sure this is the largest data set on this change for the verb like that has ever been collected. It also allows us to calculate a relative frequency. So we have a total of 4.5 million words and 486 examples. That means that like in the form of a verb occurs about 107 times per million words. That's an interesting factoid that could not be calculated before because if you just look for like, you get all kinds of false hits like prepositions and so on. So maybe that's an interesting fact to include in your, uh, in your paper as well. Okay, uh, let me maybe very briefly show you the data set. Let me just share my screen here. This is what the final data set looks like. Here we have the dependent variable, the form of the experiencer, which is either coded nom for nominative or dat for dative, the year of the text. And this is our categorical variable we're interested in the audience. Is it a text written for a learned audience or for a lay audience? Here is the variable for the text and we also code it for a number of other factors such as the position of the experiencer or the complementation pattern. Okay, so the next step is to plot the data. So it's going to be exciting. We want to make a plot that shows on the x-axis time and on the y-axis the proportion of the innovative form nominative experiences. In order to do this, you just open R uh, and then as we discussed last time, don't include the entire Excel data sheet because things can easily go wrong. There are middle English texts in there with special characters and that could cause problems. So you only want to copy and paste relevant data. Let's do this. Here's our Excel sheet again. And we only want to include the dependent variable here, uh, audience and say text. Okay, so these four variables here are important for us. Just highlight them all and put, to, put, put them into a simple text file and then save them somewhere. So let me just save this on the desktop here. Data of experiences, I call it dead exp for data of experiences. Okay, now I created a so-called script Maybe some of you already know how this works. In R, you can open the script and write down your code there so that you don't always have to improvise the code and write it afresh. Rather, you can just execute all the instructions in the script line by line. It's very simple. You just go to R here and click on File, and then it says Open Script, and open the script that I called Lost Data Experience Script. So this is the line that we talked about last time already that says Open the Data and called it data experiences, here it is. 
There we go. So now I put the data that I put into my text file into a variable called data. If you just call data, it will output the entire data set. Right. So here are the 486 examples of our psych verbs that take nominative or dative experiences with the variables that we put in. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, in order to create from this a plot with time on the x-axis and the proportion of nominative on the y-axis, we need to change this data slightly uh, into a different format where we cross-tabulate for every text the number of nominative and dative experiences. For this, you need a package that's called reshape2. So what you need to do in your version of R is just run this line here, install.packages uh, and inverted commas reshape2 once. That will install this module, this add-on, but you only need to do it once that will be installed forever. But in order to use the library, you need to load it. So for this, you just run library reshape2. Okay, so now all the special functions and uses that are associated with this library are available. In order to cross-tabulate the number of data phenomenon experiences by text, we use a function that's called dcast. This is what it looks like, dcast, which is a part of this reshape2 pattern. So I will make a new file, which I call dative experiencer graph, that x graph for short, where I use this data here that we just created as the input, and I cross-tabulate year by text and the experiencer form. So just run this line here, hopefully this will work. And then this is what the result looks like. Here we have the different years for every text, 1371, 1380, 1381, and so on. And every text, Mandelus Travels, Piers Blauman, Polychronicon, and so on. And for each of these texts, we have the number of ambiguous experiences, dative experiences, and nominative experiences. For instance, in Mandelus Travel, we find five dative experiences and zero ambiguous and zero nominative experiences. Or in Piers Plowman, we find nine ambiguous cases, 28 dative experiences, three nominative experiences, and so on. Does that make sense to everybody? Do you understand this uh, table? So now you can probably see that this is quite easy to use as the input for our plot. So in order to plot this, yeah, run, run this line of code here. Uh, so here we take the nominative experiences, that's the number that we find in this non color here, and we divide it by dative plus nominative experiences. So for instance, in the first case, we divide zero by five, which will be 0% nominative experiences, because zero examples are nominative. Or in the second case, we divide three by 28 plus three, three by 31, what is that? So that would be about 10% nominative experiences in the second text and so on. So for every text, we calculate the proportion of nominative experiences by saying nom divided by dead plus nom. Then this little tilt here means put on the other axis uh, year. So this variable here, 1371, 1380, 3081, and so on. Here I put on the y-axis proportion of nominative experiences. The x lab says time. Yeah, maybe it should say year. So that's the x-axis. I'm going to plot it from the year 1360 to 1610. And uh, finally, this parameter here, CEX, that tells you how large to make every, every data point in this graph. What we want to do is scale the data points by the number of examples that every text includes. If we have a text with a lot of examples, we want to have a big point. If we have a text with few examples, we want to have a small point. Here's a color you can change and also a point character you can change. Point character 21 will just be a circle and color dark red is the color dark red. Maybe just make it red. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is going to be exciting. Uh, what we would want, hopefully, is to see an increase in nominative experiences over time. So in 1600, we should have lots and lots of nominative experiences. In 1400, we should have very few nominative experiences. And yeah, we will see if that works. But let's go. Okay, and this is the result. Yeah, I don't know. That looks pretty good. So here in um, the 14th century, lots of data points really low. Um, 1600, way more texts that have 100% nominative experiences. Very nice, right? That's good. Yeah, that looks nice. That's pretty much what we would expect. 
Now, in the lecture, of course, we talked about S-shaped curves. Uh, so you have to imagine that we put an S-shaped curve um, over these data points. Of course, with just 400 examples, you wouldn't expect a very clear S-shaped curve to emerge because the data set is too small. But certainly, the model of an S-shaped curve is still very appropriate for this kind of data set. The next thing I did in this uh, plot is put in a legend. So if you just run this, it will put in a legend at the top left. Yeah. So now it will tell you how large every dot is for its respective number of examples. The next thing you want to do is put in our model, the regression line. So what we do is run a logistic regression exactly like we did last time using this function here. There we go. I've just used a regression that regresses the number of nominative and dative experiences against time. And here is the output. This number here, minus 31, that's your A parameter that places the S-shaped curve somewhere along the x-axis, in this case, between the 14th and 17th centuries. And this uh, coefficient here for year, that's your rate of change parameter that tells you how fast this change happens. Okay. Um, so now all you need to do is run this little bit of code here to put in the regression line. Uh, you can change the colors here. I plot this with the color called red three, uh, but you can modify this in any way you think it looks good. So let me run this. And now we plotted our model. The thick line in the middle represents our model estimate, the best fit. So this increase here in the S-shaped increase represents this time parameter of 0 0.02. So for every year increase, the log odds in nominative experiences go up by 0 0.02. And the dashed line gives you a sort of estimate for the level of certainty. With a very small data set like we have, the change might actually be considerably faster or it might be considerably slower. So you can imagine that you put the line here um, going from the bottom all the way to the top. So in this case, it would be faster. Or from the top here to the bottom, in which case it would be a bit flatter. So this thick line is our best estimate, our point estimate for how fast the change is. The dash lines indicate how much slower or faster it might reasonably be given the small data set. That looks pretty good, huh? That looks like a good graph. And this could be a graph that you could include in your paper. Make sure that when you include figures or graphs, you always, always include a caption. So here's a figure one, the rise of nominative experiences with the verb like in the history of English. Does that make sense? Step six, which is the calculation of the time needed for the innovative form to rise from one to 99% of use. That is to say, how long is the transitional period? You can also use different percentages. For instance, five to 95% might also make sense, but I quite don't like one to 99%. I think it's very interpretable. How do we do this? Uh, well, first we need to understand what the logistic function is again. Did anybody remember it? Could anybody tell me the logistic function? Yeah. Yes. That's correct. The logistic function is y equals e to the power of a plus bx divided by one plus e to the power of a plus bx. B is our rate of change parameter. It determines how fast or slow the change is. And x is our year. That's what we use to predict the frequency of the unit form. So we can put in here for x 1500 or 1400 or 1700. And then this formula will return for y a particular proportion, a percentage of the innovative form. Does this make sense? So now all we have to do is find A and B from our logistic regression, put it into this function, and then put in the year variables until we find 1% of the new form and 99% of the new form. So simply get the values for A and B from the logistic regression output, put it into variables called A and B, and then type in the logistic function into R as shown in the script, playing around with it until you find the years where the predicted new form is 1% and where the predicted new form is 99%. Take the difference between those two years and you will know how long the change takes. Let's uh, look once again at our regression output. Here it is. This is A. So I just put that here. 
a is minus 31 and our b is the rate of change parameter here it is 0 0.020437 okay and so here now we have b in order to type in the logistic function into r execute this code here we create a function which i call f and it takes one input x x will be a year like 1400 or 1578 and these values a and b here will be the values a and b that i just put into these variables all right so let's try this here we go here is my function f now i can put in any year and the function will return the proportion the predicted proportion of the innovative form so for instance if we look at this plot if i type in say 1550 i would expect a proportion of maybe a bit more than 60 percent so let's try f of 1550 and it returns 63 percent okay so now we just need to find the year where our model predicts one percent let's see what do we get for 1300 oh not bad how do that 1299 our model predicts that in 1299 one percent of all experiences will be realized as nominative. Now let's try for 99 percent. Must be after 1600 if you look at this plot, right? 1750 is the year. Yeah, in 1750, the model predicts that we go to 99 percent, and then all you do is take the difference, right? So 1750 minus 1299, and we will find 451 years. Okay, that's our solution. The transitional period for this particular change, according to the model we just constructed, is 451 years. That's actually a very slow change. In the scheme of things, many syntactic changes are a lot faster than this. Uh, it's not unusual for a syntactic change to take many centuries, but it's not very common. Uh, so this is on the slower side of syntactic changes. Do you get a question? Is that not extrapolated quite a bit because we don't have that? We don't, I don't remember us having texts from like 1700s. Mm. Yeah, so we probably would want to collect more texts from the 17th century to see if this is really true or if this is just due to bias in our texts. But according to the model we just constructed, according to our data, that's the best available data we have at the moment, that's the result we get. So what you would want to do in your paper is write something like shown at the bottom here. At this rate of change, it would take, in our case, 451 years for the innovative form to rise from 1 to 99% of use. This rate of change parameter B, 0 0.02, and 450 years for the transitional period, those two claims are exactly the same. But for humans, it's much easier to understand a claim like it takes 450 years for the form to go from 1 to 99% than the increase in log odds per year, 0 0.02. And that's why I like to include this statement as well, because it's nice, easy to understand, very interpretable. So I would like you to include this statement in your paper as well. Okay, next step, step seven. What we want to do now is include a categorical variable in our model. So the main variable we use to predict the linguistic change so far is just time. We say that time is a continuous variable. That is, it takes numbers, it runs on a scale, and the difference between every member on the scale is identical. So the difference between 1400 and 1401, so one year, is exactly the same as the difference between 1401 and 1402, or 1402 and 1403. So where this is the case, we say that the variable is continuous. But very often, we also want to include a different kind of variable, namely a categorical variable, which is just nominal. So it has different levels, um, such as lay people versus learned uh, audience, or say contraction versus no contraction. Do you have not or do you have haven't? Or the presence or the absence of an object, say for instance, in a change for what we talked about last time, the loss of two in help to do something and so on and so forth. So you might be interested in all kinds of different things, all kinds of variables that linguists are interested in. They might come as categorical variables. So we are interested in one particular effect, namely audience. So we call it audience, which can be either lay people or learned. Okay, understand this? Okay. How does this work? What's the logic of including a categorical predictor in a regression model? 
Well, so far we've had this model here where the log odds of the new form correspond to a plus bx, where b is our rate of change parameter. What we can do for a second parameter is simply include a second coefficient that is associated with the second predictor, which I labeled here x2. Okay, so we now have a slightly more complicated model that looks like this. The log odds of y are modeled as a function of the first coefficient for time, that's x1, plus a second coefficient for a second predictor, which for us will be audience. If your second predictor is a categorical variable, as in our case, then this second value here, x2, will either be 0 or 1. So the year variable x1 can be any number, 1450, 1578, and so on. But x2, the second variable, can only have two values, either 0 or 1. If it is 0, you sort of switch off the effect of b2, because 0 times b2 will be 0. If it's 1, you add the effect of b2, because 1 times b2 is b2. So you can think of it like a switch. 0, the second variable is off. 1, the second variable is on. We also call this sort of coding dummy variable. Uh, for instance, 0 could be male and 1 could be female, if you're interested in gender. Or 0 could be contraction and 1 could be no contraction. Or for us, we're going to say zero is lay people and one is learned texts. Now, you can also switch those two around, can't you? You could say one is male and zero is female, or one is no contraction and zero is contraction, or one is learned and zero is lay people. So it is very important that you keep track of what is zero and what is one, because you will evaluate the reference value, the zero value, as your baseline for the alternative value, for the applied value, which is one. So you need to keep track of your perspective, which is zero, which is one. Uh, let me illustrate this with a little graph. Say for instance, um, we plot the data for our reference value where the categorical predictor is zero. So that's our reference value. Then we would simply get the log odds of y are predicted as a function of a plus b1 for x times x1. And the second bit, b2 times the second predictor will simply be ignored because it will be zero. It's the reference value of zero. So if you look at this plot here with the red line, this red line will be your S-shaped curve for the reference category, for instance, lay people texts. But now if I add the second predictor, so I change it from zero to one, now the value for whatever B2 uh, is will be added or subtracted from the red line. So you, uh, you interpret the applied value where the predictor is one with relation to the reference value, which means you will add to the reference value that's illustrated here with the green line. So in order to understand how learned and lay people texts are different, you interpret them with relation to one of the values, the reference value, for instance, lay people texts, and then say, well, in relation to lay people texts, nominative experiences are this or that much more likely, or this or that much less likely to occur. Our hypothesis says that lay people texts should be higher, they should be more advanced, because it's probably a change from below, so it should be more advanced in genres closer to the vernacular. Okay. Well, let's try to do this in R. The first thing you want to do is run a second regression model that now includes our <coughs> categorical variable. Uh, so first you make your data frame as before with this function dcast, but you also include a categorical variable which you string together with the other variables simply with a plus. And likewise, when you run your logistic regression model, you now do not only regress nominative and dative experiences against time, but against time plus your categorical variable. So it's super simple. All you need to do is add a plus and the label of your categorical variable. Here I make a new uh, table where I cross tabulate the data, not just by text and year, but also by audience. So let's see if this works. Yes. Okay, so this is what the data looks like. Here we have a year, 1371. Here's our text, Mandeville's Travels. And here is an additional new variable audience. So this is a lay people text. Does it make sense? I simply added this variable here called audience, 
which can be either lay people or learned. And then now we use this uh, table to run a new logistic regression. I call it logistic regression two, and it's exactly the same as before, except now I add here plus audience. So it's really very, very simple. All you have to do is add the categorical variable and string it together with a plus. All right, now let's see what happens. So here is the logistic regression output. This is once again your A parameter that places the S-shaped curve at the right time. Here's your year parameter. And now you need to keep track of what your zero reference value is. The zero reference value in this case is lay people. And your applied value, that is one, is learned texts. So the way to interpret this new variable here is if you change the value for audience from lay people to learned, from lay people to learned, then the log odds of nominative experiences go up by 0.26. So let me say this again. The way to interpret this additional new line here is the value that you see here is the applied value that you switch towards. So you go from your reference value, which is lay people texts, and you go to learner texts, okay? So to your applied value. When you make this change, the log odds of our innovative form, in this case, go up by 2.6. This is not actually significantly different uh, from uh, a zero. So this model says do not actually include this particular variable because it does not uh, improve the model. So right there, that goes pretty much against our hypothesis, unfortunately. There is no significant difference between learner texts and lay people texts. It's a bit disappointing, isn't it? Yeah. Another thing you can do is reorder the reference and applied values. Say, for instance, you didn't want lay people texts as your reference value that you compare learner texts to, but the other way around, you want learner texts to be your reference value and compare them to lay people texts. Then you can do this with the function level equals, and then after a C, you reorder the values. So here you could have your particular variable. In our case, this is audience then write down equals factor of this particular variable, levels equals, and then here A, B, or B, A. In our case, A is lay people texts and B is um, learner texts, but you could now switch this around and say A is learner texts and B is lay people texts. Once you reordered your variable, you can rerun the logistic regression and you will now get the result with the opposite perspective. The results will be exactly the same. There will be no difference, just the perspective changes. Instead of evaluating the applied value with respect to your original reference value, you now interpret the results for the new applied value with respect to the other, to the alternative reference value. So let me show you how that would work in R. Here I reorder the audience factor such that the reference value is now learned and the applied value is lay people. Okay, now I changed the way R orders these two factors, and I rerun the logistic regression, and now this is the output. Now we change from learner texts to lay people texts, and when we do this, the log odds of normative experiences go down minus 0 0.26. It's exactly the same as above, here where it was plus 0 0.26, right? So, learner texts are higher than lay people texts. And now the other way around, lay people texts are lower than learner texts. The results are exactly the same, just our perspective has changed. Uh, so this is how you can change around the reference value and design your logistic regression output in a way that you find most easy to understand. Now we want to plot this. Um, in order to do this, we simply subdivide our entire data set by the two different subgroups. For instance, you might be interested in gender, in which case you would change the data now into two subgroups, one for male, one for female. And then once you have this, you have two sub data sets, you plot them as before for the first category, but then the second category, you don't use this function plot because that will create a new plot. Instead, you just use this function points 
and points will add additional points to the plot that you already created. Okay, let's try to do that. So here I subdivide the data into our two subgroups. Um, I subdivide data into data for lay people and data for learner texts. Uh, just run this. Okay, so now this variable data lay people will include all the data only for lay people. And this data here, data learned, will include the data only for learner texts. See? Okay, so here are all the examples that are coded as learned. Okay, next we create those two uh, sub graph tables, which I call data experience of graphs for lay people and data experience of graph for learned. So now this table here includes all the cross tabulation for year text by the dependent variable ambiguous data for nominative, but only for the learner texts. Okay. Now, as before, we simply plot this. So I first plot the lay people uh, data points. Did that work? Oh, yes. Okay. So these are all the data points for lay people, right? And now I add in blue with the function points, not plot, all the data points for the learner texts. There we go. Now you see in blue, put on top of the red points are uh, the data for the learner texts. Finally, we add the regression lines. Uh, we have this new logistic regression model, logistic regression tool. For the... okay. That's the um, graph here. As you can see, the blue line for learner texts and the red line for lay people texts are extremely similar. They're more or less on top of each other. Um, and that's also suggested by the fact that these two lines are not significantly different from each other. But if they were, then this is what we would want to plot. Okay, so once again, if we look at this logistic regression model output, can I see this output one more time? The way to interpret this is as you go from learner texts, which are in blue, to lay people texts, which are in red, the log odds of finding nominative experiences go down minus right so from blue to red you go down uh, 0 0.26 log odds does it make sense yeah so unfortunately it doesn't look so good for our hypothesis at the moment maybe our data set is too small or when you try to operationalize uh, vernacular versus non-vernacular registers in terms of genres the effect is just too small. The signal isn't strong enough to actually get that difference in that way. Okay, but let's continue with uh, one last point, and that is interaction effects. It's the last point for today and the most important one, so pay close attention. If the effect of one predictor is different for different levels of the second predictors, or second predictor, then we say that those two predictors interact. So for instance, a syntactic change might happen at different speeds for lay people and for learner texts. So in this case, time would interact with audience. The correct way to formulate this is that two effects do not interact, or we also say that they are additive, if the rates of change are the same for the two levels of the categorical variables. In this case, we just say audience adds to time. But we say that two effects interact also that they are interactive if the rate of change increases or decreases for different levels of your categorical variable. Okay, so that was a bit fast and a bit abstract, but maybe an example will make this clearer. So here's a completely fictitious example that I made up. Say, for instance, you wanted to measure the number of Latinisms in speech. So you look in speech samples how often people say things like aquatic or lunar or avian or dental, all kinds of Latin words. And you investigate this for two different variables. One, education. So does somebody have a high school degree, a BA degree or an MA degree? And for gender, male versus female. The outcome could look like this. In this case, you see a main effect of education. So high school students use the fewest number of Latinisms, BA students use more, and MA students use more still. Okay, so as education gets higher, the number of Latinisms increases. 
but there is no interaction between education and gender. Both male and female, more or less, as you can see in the red and the blue line, go up in parallel as education increases. So this would be an additive effect. But if the two lines diverge, if one is steeper than the other or one is flatter than the other, then you would see an interaction effect. In this case here, we still have a main effect of education. As education gets higher, you, lose, you use more Latinisms, but the effect is even stronger for females than for males. So the red line for females is steeper, it goes up even more as education increases, and the line for males is flatter, it goes up as education increases, but not as much as for females. So here we have interaction between education and gender. So that's a simple example that I think makes interaction uh, intuitively clear. In general, if the two regression lines diverge, they have different slopes, then the two effects would interact. Okay, how would that work in terms of your logistic regression output? Well, we can not only have one coefficient for time and another coefficient for our dummy variable learned versus um, lay people texts, but we can add a third predictor, which we can call B3, for the product of the two, x1 times x2. So our final model to predict normative experiences uh, would look like this. The log odds of normative experiences is A plus rate of change times time, plus our coefficient for audience times either zero for lay people or one for learned, plus a third interaction effect for the product of x1 plus times x2. Uh, so we say that B1 and B2 are main effects, whereas this new strange looking third coefficient that refers to the product of x1 and x2 are interaction effects. I will illustrate now how this would work when you see the output in your regression. Basically, as before, if you simply look at the case where you look at your reference value, you get one S-shaped curve here shown in red. That's your S-shaped curve for the reference value, say, lay people texts. Now, if we add the categorical variable, then with respect to this reference value, the second level of the categorical variable will either be higher or will be lower than this reference value. So we add to it or subtract from it, shown here with the gray arrows. Now the third value will change the steepness or the flatness of the second line with respect to the first. So it will either make the green line, which is the applied value, steeper or flatter than the reference value which is shown in the red line. So when you see the output for this interaction effect, it will tell you how much slower or how much faster the second level of the categorical variable will change than the first. In order to add an interaction effect in R, all you have to do is not use a plus sign, but a star, a times sign. So let's go to R and look at this. We run a logistic regression with an interaction effect between time and audience. It's very, very easy. All you need to do is change the plus to a star, which means time. So this now says our third logistic regression model uh, regresses the experiences, either nominative or dative, against time here, times audience. Okay, does that make sense? Let's run this and look at it. This is the output. Let's see if we can understand this. The last line here is the important one. This is how R returns your interaction effect between time, or year, and audience. It says, as you change from in this case, learned texts to lay people texts. So this is coded with learned texts as zero and lay people texts as one. Then the rate of change, the speed of the change will go down a little bit by minus 0.006. So the S-shaped curve for learned texts is this 0.024. The S-shaped curve for lay people texts is 0.024 minus 0.006. In other words, it's a bit slower, it's a bit flatter. Lay people texts change a little bit more slowly than learner texts. That's how you have to interpret this third line. 
Now, as you can see here, once again, the effect is not actually significant. So you would not want to include this in your final model. And we don't have evidence to suggest that lay people texts and learned texts change at different speeds. But if you did want to assume it, this would be the effect you got, but it's not a significant effect. So once again, we can plot this. Let me just um, here show you this plot again. So red dots are lay people texts, blue dots are learner texts. You get this graph and you can see that the blue line for um, blue line for learner texts is a bit steeper than the red line for, learned, for lay people texts. Let me just show you the regression model again so you can understand how to relate this graph to the output. So this factor here, here 0 0.024 means the blue line uh, changes at the speed of 0.024 log odds per year. The nominative experiences in the blue line go up by 0.024 log odds per year. For the red line, the change is a bit slower. It goes down by 0.006. And so therefore the red line is a bit flatter. Let me also add a legend. There we go. And then I'll add this to this final plot here in our PowerPoint presentation so that you can replicate it and look at this again. Now, in this particular case, unfortunately, we would want to include in our paper the very first model in the very first plot. Let me just show you that plot again. Okay. This right here would be the plot to include in your paper because there is no, not enough evidence that the difference between learned text and labeled text actually makes a difference. As I said, next week we'll have more data. But if this is the outcome, yes, it would be a negative outcome. And you would have to say the hypothesis that we want to investigate is not corroborated. We do not have enough evidence to suggest that uh, lay people and learned texts change at different speeds. Unfortunately, <laughs> but that's how it usually goes. I mean, you have a great idea. You think, wow, this is something I can test and investigate, but the universe isn't so forthcoming and it doesn't actually support your great ideas. And then that's just the way it is. But that's the finding in itself, right? It is, yes, but nobody likes a negative finding. Everybody likes to actually find something out rather than say, oh, I don't have enough evidence. Okay, summary. Today we learned, first of all, how to calculate the length of the tra transitional period. So how long does it take for a form to go from one to 99% of use? Then we try to understand the logic of the inclusion of a categorical variable, in our case, audience, in addition to the continuous time variable. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. So you can also change the reference value. If you don't want late people text to be a reference value, you can make learn text to reference value. And then we understood or tried to understand the logic of the inclusion of an interaction effect in addition to our continuous time variable in our categorical effect. And finally, you should also be able to visualize your data with a plot and uh, include a plot like this in your paper. Also, always make sure you include a caption. All figures and graphs always need a caption. Okay, for next time, I would like you to download the script and go through all the steps of today's tutorial again to practice this. Make sense? Like no, no, use the entire data set. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, uh, that's it for today. Thanks everybody for coming. We'll have one more session on how to analyze our historical data next week, and then hopefully you're good to go to put it all together in your paper. Okay, so thanks very much for coming, for your hard work, and for your attention. See you, see you next time.